Hello, I'm Dr. Harper. This is a lecture in project management, and this video is a lecture video. Now, this video is just an introduction and an overview to get used to the uh, to get into the uh, PMBOK, the quantitative knowledge areas of schedule, cost, quality, risk, and procurement. As uh, we get into the homework, then I'll go deeper into the material. But this is just a brief introduction to all five of these areas as we get going with the, uh, uh, with the material. So let's start with schedule. In uh, the Project Schedule Management, PM Bach 6th edition, uh, can be described as involves the defining and controlling the timely completion of the project. And here's where we have schedules. And there are uh, a number of major processes. We will, we'll, we will be looking at define activities, sequence activities, estimate the duration of the activities, then develop your schedule, then control your schedule. And so this video is really just talking about how to set these things up. Uh, the actual details of the quantitative uh, developing and controlling the schedule will be in other videos in the homework. So this is just an introduction. Uh, there's going to be a lot more uh, within the homework videos for the application. Also, in uh, this course, uh, the schedule management, I will do uh, quite a bit on schedule management. We'll be doing CPM and PERT and GAN charts and crashing and a lot of different things. And so a lot of the analytics in this course will be within the schedule knowledge area uh, for this week. Okay, define activities, uh, the deliverables and activity list. Sequence activities, we'll have something called uh, uh, an activities on arrow and activities on node and as well as Gantt charts. Uh, but we can generate these networks. But once we have the durations, then we can create a Gantt chart. And a Gantt chart is very popular, but it's limited. Developing the schedule, here's where we'll look at critical path method and PERT, program evaluation review technique. And then finally, the control schedule, monitoring, crashing, fast tracking, and resource allocation. So this is a very good foundation, introduction, overview to uh, schedule management uh, in, uh, in projects. And I'll be bringing to the table, uh, beginning today, uh, beginning this week, and also this topic, uh, in subsequent weeks, I'll just keep building on this so that it will be a running theme. So let's do some introduction here before we get to the other areas. Okay, first of all, define your activities. You start with a work breakdown structure, and that's all the work to be done. You'll decompose that into an acti activity list. And that activity list ba basically says, here's everything that we're doing on a schedule basis. A de decomposition, though, in more complex projects creates activities from work packages. In other words, larger projects where you have uh, a lot of activities and a lot of work to be done, uh, the decomposition is just creating an activity list in small to medium-sized projects. Into large, medium, and large projects, you have something called work packages. In other words, the work packages is a combination of activities. And in those activities, the work packages is the lowest, uh, the lowest management level or the lowest uh, identification in the work breakdown structure. But within that, you'll have activities, and that work package just will manage that. Uh, but up here, the work breakdown structure will have actually activity, the activity list in it in, small, uh, uh, in smaller uh, projects. A work package can represent a collection of activities. They represent deliverable, a defined amount of work. And some, some work packages will define uh, 20 hours of work, one week's worth of work, for example where we, 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 uh, we uh, decide it like in a scrum. We, and, and, I, and, and we'll look at this more in the um, uh, uh, Agile project management. Well, you'll, you'll design it, and then you'll do it, and then you'll, you'll decide where we're going, the linking to the next work package. Predetermined amount of time, uh, pre-allocated resources, when these resources are done, we're done. Other groupings sufficient for management control of reporting, scheduling, and directing work. So the work package can be defined different ways depending on the project. Uh, again, there's where uh, the uh, art comes in. The goal, define your activities in enough detail to schedule and manage your project. Uh, caution one, a too detailed 
Too much detail introduces unnecessary control. And that's micromanagement, another word for that. Not enough detail creates inadequate direction and you'll have internal scope creep. In other words, we're starting in this direction and there's not enough guidance uh, in these work packages. So what happens is, is they'll start creating their own thing and all of a sudden they'll deliver something that really doesn't apply to the project. So you need to have, again, the art, uh, enough detail, uh, enough detail to know the direction you're going, but not too much detail where you're micromanaging and it becomes uh, prohibitive uh, for quality. Definition initially depends on the project, the project manager, and the project team. Every project is different. Every project manager is different, and every team is different. And so uh, that's why you need project managers and people who understand project, not only for the project manager, but also the project team. For example, here's a work breakdown structure that we used before. And from this, the lowest level, level here, and this is a very small project, but the lowest level in the uh, WBS will be the actual activity list. That's an example. Okay. Now, defining activities can, as I, as I said before, can be uh, resources, time, deliverables. Okay. Uh, but however you do it, you come up with an activity list to be scheduled. And now we move into the scheduling. Sequence your activities. So the activity list then, well, now that we have it, uh, you'll have relationships which create a network. So some activities need to be done before other activities are done. So you sequence them. So for example, suppose, and there's all different ways of sequencing them. Uh, well, the dependencies could be mandatory, discretionary, external. You have to do this before others. Sometimes it's mandatory uh, internally. Uh, I'm requiring this before something else and some is discretionary. Let's just do this first because I think it's going to be better. Uh, and then there's other there's types of, of diagrams which we'll look at here in just a second. So here's our activity list. Those are activities. So then we there's all different kinds of sequencing protocols. We'll look at only one in this course and that is the predecessor activity. In other words, what, what precedes an activity? So these are activities, one through seven, and there's our description. Uh, what precedes activities one and two? Well, nothing precedes it. So activities one and two are the first thing you do in the activity. That's the first, these first two activities in the schedule. But what about activity three? Well, we're going to have a predecessor activity of one, so one has to be done before three starts. Because activity one is a predecessor activity to three. One comes before three. Okay, uh, four and five, activity two has to be done before four and five can start. So once activity two is done, then activities four and five can start. And notice activity six has two predecessors. Both three and four have to be completed before six starts. And finally, activity seven, obtain approvals. Well, you have to have three, four, and five done. You have to pretty much have everything done before you have your approval on that work. Okay. Uh, so we can take these predecessor activities with the activities together and create a schedule. Okay. And here comes our schedule. The first schedule is called activity on arrow, where each of the arrows here represents our activities. Activity one, activity two, three, four, five. Well, here's our activity. Here's the predecessors. And that is needed to define a, a schedule. And so here's our schedule over here. Uh, this is our network. Okay. Uh, where activity one, uh, the nodes, the, the, the squares here are nodes. So a node represents a point in time. The arrow represents an activity uh, time. So one and two have no predecessors, but activity three here has one predecessor, so that, that is activity one. So one has to be finished before three starts. So this node represents the finish of activity one and the beginning of activity three. Uh, and, and so you, we do this over and over again. Now, this dotted line here, this dotted activity, says activity seven has three predecessors, three, four, and five. So three, four, and five have to be finished before seven starts. But activity six only has two predecessors, three and four. So six only has two predecessors. So this, act, this node 
is the finish of 3 and 4. This node represents the finish of 3, 4, and 5. Well, 7 is not dependent, or uh, 6 is not dependent on 5. It's only dependent on 3 and 4. So this dotted line here has no duration. It's just a relationship. That 7, this node says, well, 3, 4 and have to be finished. But then 5 also has to be finished for 7 to start. This node is just 3 and 4. And 6 is dependent on 3 and 4. So then, then you have activity on node. So each node is an activity. 1 and 2 starts, then 3, 4, and 5. And then now the arrows represent the predecessor relationships. So 3 is dependent on 1. 4 is dependent on 2. 5 is dependent on 2. 6 is dependent on 3 and 4. 7 is dependent on 3, 4, and 5. So the arrows represent the predecessor relationships. So in the activity on node, uh, and these are used for different reasons. The activity on arrow is used quite often for uh, uh, other resources. I can put a resource here and see when and where the resources are being used. Activity on node is very easy to analyze as far as paths are concerned. 136, uh, 137, 246, 247, uh, 257. There are five paths through this, through this network. And so each one of these paths then will have a duration. Well, to get to durations, uh, we have to look at the time. We'll do that in a minute. Now, uh, I said we're only going to be looking at predecessor activity relationships, and that's true. But there are other relationship dependencies. And I, I just briefly mentioned these. We're not going to do these. In, we're not going to get into these in this course. If you had a whole course just on critical path method PERT, then we would. But I will mention them to be complete. Okay. Uh, the predecessor activity uh, really refers to the finish of the predecessor. The, the predecessor finish is matched to the successor start. So P as a, PA is a predecessor and SA is the successor. A successor activity comes after the predecessor uh, in the definition. The predecessor is defined and then the successor is defined. But then the finish of the predecessor will be matched with the start of the successor. And this is the finish to start um, definition that we've used above. But there are other relationships. For example, finish to finish. Finish to finish. Where the finish of the predecessor has to be matched with the finish of the successor. In other words, the predecessor is defined and the successor is defined. Well, whenever they start, the finish has to be, has to be matched up. They have to finish at the same time. Some projects require that, especially construction projects, for example. Now, some are start to start. In other words, the predecessor is defined and the successor is defined, but then they both have to start together. It doesn't matter when they finish, but they have to start at the same time. So uh, often, a lot of times, the start to start requirements has to do sometimes with resource allocation, uh, but also with project with projects that are funded. Okay, the funding has to be allocated early on. Even though successor comes after the predecessor, you can start both at the same time. And then start to finish. This is unusual. A lot of people say, when would a pre predecessor start be matched with a successor finish? That doesn't make sense. Not logically, initially, but when you have a repetitive activities, you know, they're to start a uh, uh, predecessor, successor, predecessor, successor, predecessor. When you have a repeat type operation, okay, the start of the predecessor, and the and uh, and then you have a successor, but then the finish of the successor has to be match has to be matched up with the start of the next predecessor. So when you have an activity predecessor successor uh, matching up, is done over and over and over and over again, then. The start of the process, uh, predecessor, the PA start, has to be matched with a previous SA finish. Okay, and sometimes sometimes that's done when you have repeat type uh, uh, things that are repeated. Again, we're not going to get into this in the modeling. We'll just look at the first one, finish to start. Okay, uh, another type of uh, network relationship is lag and lead, lead and lag. In other words, even though, and again, we have the finish to start, but even though the finish could be a point in time, 
and uh, you you the predecessor has to be finished before the successor starts. Sometimes you can start the successor before. Let me do it this way. You can start the successor activity a little bit before the predecessor because this successor activity might have some design in it or might have some connection with bringing people together before they start. So some things can be done before the activity starts, but it's really the start of the activity before uh, the, uh, the... So you can have a lead time to start things, get things started before the successor activity actually officially starts. And that's called a lead time. The other is a lag time. So once the predecessor finished, sometimes you can't really start. There's a little bit of a lag time in here. Uh, a good example of this, for an example of lead time, is you might contact the people to bring them together uh, before the activity starts. So there's a lead time uh, in bringing the people together. Now the lag time here, a good example here, is the um, uh, in... in uh, in construction, uh, the predecessor activity, you might have to paint the floor before you put up the drywall or before you install the electricity, uh, the electrical uh, grid uh, within uh, within a um, uh, within a, uh, a house or a, a a a office building or something. And so, even though you finish the painting, the lag time you have to wait for it to dry before they start walking on it. Okay. And so there's a lag time. So again, we're not going to get into this in this uh, uh, course or in this uh, development, uh, but these do exist to be complete. Okay. Now let's get into duration. Let's get into timing. So the idea here, we have our activity list. Now we're going to estimate uh, the actual duration. So the estimation of how long is this going to take? Now notice I have weeks. Uh, the first one takes five weeks, then two weeks, then two weeks, three, 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 one. Well, how do we come up with these, these time estimates? Well, this, again, this is uh, a process unto itself. The, there's four different primary, or there's four estimation, estimation approaches. That's, you know, 80, 90% of things that are done. First, expert judgment, solicit expert opinion. What do you think? Uh, well, you got to be careful here because expert judgment, soliciting expert opinion is not necessarily from intelligence or or it's more from experience and what do you feel is going to be the time uh, the other is analogous estimation and this is application for other projects parametric modeling and sometimes when you have very set projects you say what are the tasks these tasks you go to a manual that says that test takes this much time this task takes that much time these times of formulas, templates, and processes are very popular in software development. So if you have to generate uh, a five, 10 lines of code or 50 lines of code, it's going to take this much time. And they're going to test it. It'll take this much time. They're going to have a beta test this much time. So a lot of that is in software development. And finally, the three-point estimate. Well, the three-point estimate we're going to be using in PERT. You'll have an optimistic time. What's the shortest it can be? Pessimistic time, the longest it can be, the most likely time, and you, then you'll weight those and take a weighted average of your, your actually estimated time. And we'll look at this at PERT here in just a second. But once you have the durations, now my definition is activities, my predecessor activities, and the time, duration, time. Well, on the activity on arrow, I can put the time down here below it. And that's a good, that's uh, one reason you'll use activity on arrow. You can actually see where the resource of time is being allocated. You can also put cost, you can also put uh, human resources, you can put material resources and inventory, etc. cetera. Uh, but with activity on node, you put the time right in the node. Time five, time two, time three, time one, etc. So you put the time right in the node, and now you can use the network and the timing to determine uh, how long is this project going to take. Okay. Now, once you have the time, now you can generate a Gantt chart. Now, a Gantt chart is just, just a timeline of a project. For example, activities one and two have no predecessors, so they're going to start right on time zero. But activity one takes five days, five weeks. So we'll have five weeks. So week one, two, three, four, five. It's a timeline. 
uh, put five arrows, you could put five X's, you can put five circles, you can put a line there. Uh, people, you do different things. You put five emojis, you can do different things there. Activity two has, has a duration of two, so I have one, two. Three has a predecessor of one. Activity one. So one has to be finished before activity three can start. So on, on uh, time five, only then can activity three start. So, so three has to wait for one to finish, and then it can start for two days or for two weeks, one, two. Activity four and five has a predecessor of, uh, of two. So two has to be finished before four and five can start. They both have a duration of three, one, two, three. Uh, activity six has two predecessors, three and four. So both of these both have to be finished. So they're both not finished until seven. Only then can activity six starts for a duration of three, one, two, three. Activity seven has three predecessors, three, four, and five. All three of these have to be completed. So all three are not completed until seven again. And now the duration is one, so it goes one. Okay, and so notice in the GAN chart, you have times, durations, and also you have a timeline up here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, through 10. Well, notice uh, this is a duration of one week, and so this one here represents the end of one week. So all of these times represent the end of a time period. All times in, are interpreted as the end of a time period, and we will do this not only in this development, in everything we do in uh, PERT and CPM. It's the end of a time period. Okay, for example, activity one finishes on five. What does that mean? The end of week five. Activity three starts at five. What does that mean? It starts at the end of week five, which is the same as week six, but it doesn't start on six. It starts on five, the end of week five. And so you have to be really careful with the terminology or you can get mixed up. So the Gantt chart, uh, notice in the Gantt chart, you're going to have an early start, the early start of each activity, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is 0, 0. This, the early start, is uh, 2 and 2. Uh, this one is 5. You'll have an early start, you'll have an early finish, and the time of completion. In other words, the early start will be when it starts. The early finish is when it finishes. And then the time of completion of the project is, you can see down here, it's going to be of the entire project. It's going to be right here, week 10. It's going to take a total of 10 weeks to do this project. Well, it's not that easy to see from just the definition, but the Gantt chart shows you it takes 10 weeks. And all times are interpreted as the end of a time period. Now, let's go into this a little bit deeper. Look at activity number seven here. What if this activity was delayed one day? The early start is eight, the early finish is nine. Well, the project is still going to take ten. Uh, the the uh, time of completion of the project is still ten. What if this is delayed two days? One, I mean two weeks, sorry. I keep saying days, these are weeks. Two weeks, one, two. The project is still going to take 10 weeks. But what if activity seven was delayed one, two, three weeks? Then the project will be delayed. So the maximum amount of time that activity seven can be delayed is two, and that's called a slack time. So the slack time is defined as the maximum number of, of uh, time units, that activity can be delayed and not delay the time of completion of the project. That's our definition of slack. Now, the Gantt chart is not a good device to determine slack. So now we have early start, early finish. Uh, well, depending on when you start, you're going to have a late start, late finish, and slack. So for each of these activities, you're going to have five pieces of information. The earliest time an activity can start and the earliest time it can finish, 
the latest time it can start and the latest time it can finish and not delay the project and the slack time. So you need those five pieces of information to manage the schedule of a project. Well, the Gantt chart is not a good, good tool for that, especially with large projects. You need another tool, and that tool is the critical path method. Now, in the critical path method, you will have early start, early finish, late start, late finish, but you will also have slack. You'll have all five of those. So the Gantt chart will give you the early start, early finish, and time of completion. But the crit critical path will be those three plus late start, late finish, and slack. And slack is called the total slack. Sometimes it's called total float. A critical activity is an activity with zero slack. And all critical activities defines what is called the critical path. And there's where this method gets its name. And we'll be looking at this a lot in this course. Now, one more, one more technique, and that is what if, uh, let's come back up here when we had, we estimated the time. Remember we had a three point duration time? We're going to have three different time, optimistic, pessimistic, most likely. We can do the same thing down here uh, with PERT. If we have three time estimates, we can use all three time estimates to estimate the mean of the duration. We can also use this to estimate the variance of the duration, and that will give us a time of completion, and this time of completion then will be a random variable, a normal distribution with a mean and a variance. And the PERT now, we can actually calculate probabilities. And we'll do this in this course. Today, I'll just be giving a, a really brief introduction. The homework will be an introduction on how to work a CPM, how to work a PERT. It's just the mechanics. But subsequent uh, topics will be going deeper and deeper and deeper into CPM and PERT to where you understand uh, how these things can be used uh, with risk analysis and uh, different types of probabilistic analysis. Okay, so the critical path method. Now in this lecture, I'm not gonna go over the details. At this point, let me uh, bring up, okay, let's come back up to here. Uh, let's open this up. There we go. Let's open up my website, go to project management. If you come down to here to the videos, uh, okay, right here under the uh, PMBOK 2. So even though this video is under the fifth edition, it's the same technique. So here I have a video for the critical path method. Okay. And so this video, I highly recommend you watch because this will go through all the details on how to do a critical path method. And once you do that, and then in the homework, I'll go over how to do PERT because the, the critical path method, CPM, is embedded in PERT. PERT has a front end and a back end, but then you'll have the CPM in the middle. So this P CPM is the mechanics in the middle part of PERT. So look at this video. Okay. Uh, so right here, I do go over, I'll, I'll, I won't go through the, 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 um, the algorithm, but I will talk about the algorithm. L the video goes step by step by step, all eight steps in the early stage and late stage, two stages, and eight steps within each stage. Okay, the first stage is to determine the early start for each activity. And there are four steps. Uh, and we'll go through for no predecessor, the early start is zero zero. Uh, step two is for all activities, you add the duration to get the early finish. Zero plus five is five. Zero plus two is two. Step three, if you have one predecessor, the early start is the early finish of the predecessor. If you have only one predecessor, then the early start here is the early finish of that predecessor. So that five is the early start. Five plus two is seven for step two. And if you have more than one, it's the max of if you have more than one predecessor, it's the max. So the max is seven, so you bring down seven, seven plus three is 10. So you notice I'm not really going over it, I'm just saying this is explained in detail in the video. The second stage, then you have to invert uh, the predecessor to successors. 
Again, that's gone, that's gone over in the video. And then uh, the primary uh, goal of the second stage of a CPM is to determine the late finish. And the late finish here is determined. Uh, and there are, again, four steps here. So make sure you go over that video. I'm not going to do it, do it right now. It's a separate video. You can look at that video over and over again. And that's not a lecture video. I call it a presentation video. Okay, and that does, uh, it's an instructional video or presentation. And I pre present how to do this. Okay, uh, and then the, uh, the homework video is applying it and working the problems. Okay, so I can also, and also the, uh, the um, when you have the slack here, notice the activities with zero slack. Boom, that has zero slack. Let me do this. That has zero slack. Activity three has zero slack. That has zero slack. And then activity six has zero slack. Okay, boom. Is that all? Yep, these others have uh, slack, but activity one, three, and six have zero slack. So, uh, in because of that, let me shade these a little bit. That one, that one, and that one. Now, what does that mean? That means if those activities are delayed, the project is delayed. There's no slack. Okay, so therefore, these are referred to as critical activities. These are critical activities. And all critical activities taken together is called the critical path. And that's what I say down here. Now, the reason that's important is to manage a project, all activities that are critical, there's where most of your resources are going. You do not want those activities to be delayed because if that act one activity is delayed, the whole project's delayed. So most of your resources are focused on those activities. Now, the non-critical activities are also important, and we'll get into that a lot in this course. The non-critical activities are also important, but they're not, they're not, they're not as critical. So the one, say, with the greatest slack down here, a four, maybe you have so much slack Maybe that's the, those are the activities you outsource to a third party, and now you have procurement of services. So we'll get into that a lot more in this course, but that's why I focus on CPM and PERT, because there's where you manage a project, especially the time of a project and the cost of a project and procurement and resources, etc. So now that I have my critical path, I can, I can identify it within Gantt, I can identify it with the uh, uh, arrow, uh, AO, uh, AOA, activity on node, the node network. Uh, and so this is, usually Gantt charts are very popular in presentations. And in this course, you will be presenting and creating a video and a PowerPoint with a Gantt chart, but I'll show you how to build them. Uh, you can build them with an Excel very easily and very quickly. And I'll go, we'll get into that in this course. Okay. Uh, and um, now, network durations and pass through the networks. So now that I have the durations here, either on, uh, on the arrow or the node, even the Gantt chart, you look at the different paths. Now I can add up uh, like 1, one three, six is their duration is 5, 2, and 3. Well, 5, 2, and 3, uh, the duration is 10. Well, the path with the greatest time is the max is the uh, the time of completion of the project the the path with the greatest time is the time of completion of the project now these other paths have less time in other words one three seven well on five plus two plus one well notice that the difference is going to be two well that difference of two represents a slack and that slack is going to be on one or more of the activities in that path. Well, five and two are common to both paths, right? The only difference is three and one. The difference is two, so therefore activity one will have a slack of two. Is that true? Yes, because you can see that up here in the network. Come back to the network, the CPM. Activity two has a slack of two. Now, that's why the CPM algorithm 
will generate all the slacks of all of these activities, not going this way, but through the algorithm. It gives you all five numbers. Now you can manage this project. Okay. Uh, I have some examples here that you can go over at your leisure when you watch TV, or eating popcorn, whatever. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Another, just to give an example of CPM. So here's an example of building a house. Uh, this is a, a small example. Here's all the paths through the network. But down here, I built a network. There's a network, and I've highlighted in dark here in bold. That's the critical path through this network. And the other activities are non-critical. This is activity on node. Uh, or example of building a house on a Gantt chart. Again, Gantt charts are very popular. Actually, here's this goes 1 through 19 and then 2242. So you can see where the critical path are, the path is, and also the non-critical activities. Okay, now PERT. As I mentioned before, PERT has three estimates. Optimistic, most likely, and pessimistic. And essentially, the difference between PERT and CPM is PERT, we have at the beginning three estimates. And from those three estimates, we use this equation to determine the, uh, the mean duration or the expectation duration. E is expectation operator. Expe ex expectation of duration is the average, the mean duration. Uh, we can also calculate the variance. So we have a mean and a variance like a normal distribution. Uh, as it turns out, each of these activities is a, uh, this. Uh, to calculate the mean and variance with these equations, we're assuming a beta distribution for each activity. But the beta is an assumption to uh, justify these equations, to estimate the mean and variance. But once you have the mean and variance, you bring the mean down here, and this mean is used in the critical path method in the CPM to determine your slack and your critical path. So once you have your, your critical path and your slack, uh, you know what your critical path is, and your durations here, you can sum up to get the actual uh, time of completion of the project. Well, since you're summing betas, usually large projects have a lot more than just three activities that are critical. You have, like, like the building the house, you sum up a number of, of variables in beta or whatever they are, by the central limit theorem, that's going to follow a normal distribution. So the time of completion then follows a normal distribution by the central limit theorem with a mean of 11.2, right there, and a variance of 2.25, which implies a standard deviation of 1.5. And now we can calculate probabilities. That what's the probability that the time of completion is going to be less than 11.2 or more than 11.2? What's the probability that the time of completion is, and you make a statement? Well, down here I say that it's less than 10 days, less than 11, 12, 13, 14, and here's the actual probabilities. And here's the Excel functions. And we will be doing this in here. We'll be doing this in here, uh, this, this, next, uh, this first homework assignment. But then we keep going deeper and deeper and deeper as we go through this course. And that's why the homework, and then the homework is going to be important because I'm going to have a homework video that goes through the mechanics of, of the, these uh, operations. So this is just introducing it. I'll go deeper into uh, the homework videos. Okay, controlling. And again, there's a number of different uh, control mechanisms. First of all is monitoring. Can include various elements such as monitoring probabilities of critical and non-critical activities in PERT. We will do this in here. Not this week, but uh, then we'll take, uh, I think, the golden project and the silver project, and we'll modify it, modify it, modify it, and we'll be monitoring things. Identifying and managing parallel paths, which we'll do next. the next topic. Critical path occurring in PERT CPM, including cost, labor, other resources, in addition to time uh, in the Gantt chart, critical path, PERT. And so this we will do in here because this is extremely practical. So one deliverable from this course is knowing how to do this. Crashing. I find crashing is very, very common in projects. Most people don't know what crashing is. They don't know how to manage crashing. When I was a consultant, uh, this is one of the first 
when I got out of research and got into industry, this is one of the first things they had me come to a major, um, a major uh, a company to consult with crashing uh, their network because they didn't know how to do it. And we'll talk about crashing. Fast tracking, I'll, we won't do fast tracking in here, but I'll talk about it. Uh, critical chain, I won't do critical chain in here, but we'll talk about it. Resource leveling, same thing. I give some examples on resource leveling or resource smoothing, uh, and I give examples. So this is an introduction to scheduling. Now that took longer than that's going to need it. That that I need uh, that's going to take longer than what I'm going to need for cost, quality, risk, and procurement because I don't cover as much. Uh, but schedule, I see that as a hub, and then cost will in, be included in quality, then risk, then procurement. So let's look at let's look at cost. So bringing up the cost is is concerned with the identification and acquisition of goods and services from outside sources. Okay, uh, so this is that's procurement. Thought that thought that didn't sound right. Let me bring up cost. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, here it is. Is the involved defining controlling the cost to ensure completed uh, the project is completed within the approved budget. So now we're looking at budgeting. So there's only three, or uh, well, there's only four processes. We're only going to look at these last three. And again, we're not going to get into this that much in this course. Uh, I, I found I have found this to be very specific to the actual project that you're dealing with. Uh, but you're estimating your cost. There's different types of costs. Determining your budget, uh, taking these costs, putting them in a budget timeline, and then controlling them with the earned value analysis. And we will do EVA earned value analysis. Okay. Estimating your cost, well, you know, there's different kind of costs. Uh, first of all, you take your scope, scope statement, your work breakdown structure, you start with that, and that can come into either work packages or activities, code of accounts, and that'll come down to your activities and tasks. So somewhere in here, uh, you're going to start allocating cost related to either your work packages, that's the lowest level, and then from that, you'll have a code of accounts or cost of accounts, you'll have accounting you'll say these work packages have this cost and that goes into some kind of accounting uh, ledger uh, or you'll have activities and the activities will cost something and so cost is going to be associated with the lowest level of management uh, the lowest level within um, the work breakdown structure okay uh, whether it's activities and then the activities can be broken into tasks but that's within an activity or within a work package but then the breakdown of the second day, a secondary cost structure, you can say, okay, well, these are the primary costs from the work breakdown structure, but you'll have risk costs, okay, from your risk register. We'll look at risk register in a minute. You'll have contingency reserves. Well, you'll have management reserves of out of scope and contingency reserves of unplanned in scope. So these reserves, called contingency reserves for unplanned, now you'll have a, a budget for when you have, because remember, uh, every project is unique, and every project could have things you you, you have unplanned uh, costs related to something you didn't expect. Well, you have a content reserve to allocate to those unplanned uh, activities or unplanned uh, risks that happen. Uh, but then you also you'll have a, a out of scope management reserves. So you'll have okay, well here's out of scope. So you'll have a reserve over here. A risk reserve costs, cost of risk reserve, uh, to where you have a contingency plan for out of scope. And so if a stakeholder, key stakeholder says, oh, I want this, fine, here's the budget for that. You have to approve that budget before this happens. So you'll have a contingency reserve of out of scope, contingency contin 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 reserve uh, cost for in scope unplanned, uh, and so those are reserves. And then you have quality. Uh, quality could be a source of secondary costs, uh, and these have to do with improvement of specifications. Because uh, once you start, a lot, of, almost always, you start. You think you know what you need to do to meet specifications at the quality, at the expectation of the key, st key stakeholders, but you don't know until you get into the project. And then once you get into it, you go, okay, I need to improve my specifications, and these are costs to do that. And you have a reserve for that, and then you then you engage uh, that that uh, that that reserve budget, or changes needed to meet the specifications. So this is improvement, but then you say, oh, I didn't know I needed that, 
to actually just meet the specifications as stated. Either reserves to meet them, that was not originally uh, known, or to improve specifications that was not originally uh, expected until you get into it. Once you get into a project, things will change. Expect change. Change will happen. And so you have uh, secondary cost structures to support that. And this is good. A lot of people say, well, I don't want to do that. This is good project management. And a project organization who understands this will take the risk of those of those contingency funds for either uh, out of scope, unplanned in scope, or improvement, or meeting specifications once you get into project. If you don't have those contingency funds, then you have missed mismanagement because they don't have the money to actually make those changes. Okay, down here, then you have the types of estimates. Uh, first of all, a uh, rough order of magnitude. This R, this ROM is rough order of magnitude. Uh, that's a uh, you can have budgetary and definitive. Method of estimating, rough order of magnitude, you can have parametric, you can have analogous, analysis. Accuracy, well, rough order of magnitude would be very low uh, accuracy. I'm just guessing. Uh, when you guess, uh, rough order of magnitude could have the largest uh, inaccuracy, okay? Uh, largest variability. Uh, and so budgetary is medium. Definitive is high, where you actually analyze exactly how much this is going to cost. Preparation, this could be in days, say days. Rough order of magnitude could be in hours. Uh, could be within an hour. Ah, oh, let's just put this, boom, 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 let's go. Uh, uh, budgetary could be weeks, and definitive could be months because you're analyzing this thing. Uh, the approach is judgment. Okay, here is history. Okay, learn from history. And these are actual measurements of data that have been uh, uh, from experiment or from analysis or quotes from, from third parties. Okay, uh, parametric lying on, on curves, skill factors, capacity reports. Analogous is comparing similar projects. Analysis down here, I've talked about that. And that could include uh, this weighted, weighted uh, mean. So once we've had these costs uh, for an activity, and remember the tasks are not part of the work breakdown structure, but the activities and the costs are. So once you have the cost of an activity, you can break that out into the different tasks. And so this, these tasks are within an activity. And that's within a work package. And that's pretty much uh, embedded in how this has got, uh, this, how this is, how this is done. Okay, conventionally low tech routine projects uh, usually use cost estimating manuals. High tech creative projects, you do cost change uh, management. In other words, there's more effort into the high tech because there's a lot more risk. Determine your budget. This is simple. Once you have your costs, you allocate, allocate those costs over time, and that's referred to as a budget. Another word for budget in project management is called a cost baseline. Cost baseline is the same as a budget. The reason I call it a baseline is because the baseline is a budget, but that budget can change. Usually a budget doesn't change. You have to redo a budget, but a cost baseline within a project will change. You have different milestones that you will reevaluate your base cost baseline, and you have a new cost baseline because in a project, change happens. In a company, usually those budgets are fixed for the year. Next year you redo the budget, but in a cost baseline it can it can be changed it can change within within a project. Okay, then finally you have control cost. Here we're getting into a technique. Here we're getting to manage to, to uh, mechanics. So now that I have uh, consider a six month project following this cost baseline. So here's my cost of the activity, and here's my cost baseline or my schedule, my budget schedule to budget. Now assume. Now, control cost says, okay, I'm going to control the cost once the project starts. Now, assume the project reports at the end of March. So at the end of March, let me do this. Okay, March, March, March. Come down here. Table design. Let's shade this in. So now what, we're, what I'm saying here, that's too dark. Oh, there we go. What I'm saying here is at the end of March, we have been conducting this project for three months. It's a six-month project. For three months, we've been conducting this project. Well, at the end of March, 
the total cost is reported as $12,500. This is reported as how much money has actually been spent has been has been uh, spent during this time okay and let me let me uh, bold that okay well good well what is budgeted one one two one three three four five six seven eight eight thousand has been budgeted twelve thousand five hundred has been spent so the spending is greater than the budget so you're overspending and so in, the, when, in this earned value management, when you're looking at the earned value, you have spent more than you have been planned to spend. So when you spend more than you plan to spend, you're overspending. And so this earned value analysis within earned value management should indicate that, and it will in just a second, I'll show you. Well, I'll, I'll indicate where it's at. Okay, well, fine. They say, yeah, I, I've, I've spent, I've overspent. But the project managers, manager says, yeah, I've overspent, but look how much I've done. Activity one and two, I'm 100% complete, and three, I'm 60% complete. Oh, okay. Well, according to the schedule, at the end of March, activity one should, get, should be completely done. And it is, 100% complete. And activity two here should be what two three out of five it should be 60 percent completed but it's a hundred percent completed so i've i have generated more work than scheduled what about activity three well activity three is three out of five is 60 percent too well activity one and activity three is right on schedule but activity two is ahead of schedule so yes I have spent more than the cost baseline has planned to spend, but I have, I have accomplished more. I'm ahead of schedule. And so being ahead of schedule here, let me bold that. That should be reflected in this earned value management analysis, and it is, and it will be. Okay, so the earned value analysis talks about the planned value the actual cost and earned value. These are the three types of um, metrics within something called an earned value analysis of your cost. But in the EVA, you'll be lo looking at the budget and you'll be looking at the schedule, the combining those two. And that's why the schedule and cost go together. Okay, so the plan value are these are these values up here. The actual cost is a 12,500. Now the earned value is not really up here, but the earned value takes the cost baseline and it takes this percentage here and puts it together to estimate something called an earned value. And that's part of the earned value analysis. Now this next page, I go over it here, okay? I, th this page here is a summary of going over it, and here's the actual calculations. But let's bring back uh, my website. Okay, notice down here for the EVA, right here, the earned value analysis. Here's the concepts of mechanics. Here's a video. I urge you and encourage you to watch this video. But then the next video is actually going into Excel and showing you how to solve this in Excel. Okay, and then I actually have the Excel file here. So this video has the Excel file, and this video has the Excel file. In other words, this video is talking about the concepts of the mechanics, and this is actually applying the mechanics. So again, these videos will show you, uh, will present uh, how to do this. Okay. These are additional terms from the Project Management Institute, and I won't go over these. Uh, because some, I know I've had people from this course and from my courses actually get a job as an earned value analysis EVA manager, earned value management manager. There's a lot more than what I'm covering here, but this is the basis. Yeah, you'll do this, but you'll do more. And here's some more additional terms for someone who goes into this profession. Okay, so that's an introduction to the cost. Now quality. 
Okay, in quality, I'm not going to cover that much in quality, uh, but quality ensures the project meets the and exceeds the stakeholder needs and expectations. Again, notice I say meet, exceeds stakeholder needs and expectations. And so here, quality is focusing on quality is defined by the stakeholder, stakeholders. And it's not defined by the company, it's defined by the stakeholders, all of them. Okay. And there are three, uh, three uh, major processes. And I won't look at each of them individually. I'll look at them as a group. I start with a background of a project quality program and how that's, how that's different than uh, uh, quality within, within uh, uh, an organization, within a business unit. And then we have uh, the uh, plan the quality management, identify the process to generate the plan, you implement it, and then you control it and monitor it. Okay. Well, I'll take all of these together. Okay. First of all, what I emphasize here as a the big picture, again, quality is applied to the project. It really varies from project to project. But here, the project quality program here, I divide up, I divide this up into three areas: quality planning, quality assurance, and quality control. And the quality planning is here's where you define the quality, what quality is, and the definition really varies. Uh, what is quality, uh, the standards, and the process to achieve them, you create your plan. Now, this is before you do any measurements. You create, say, here's what I'm going to do. And notice this is in the planning group, the planning group of the uh, uh, processes. And then quality assurance is implementing the plan. Okay, now you're going to implement, implement assurance uh, in this in this definition. It says I'm assuring that this plan is applied according to the design. In other words, you can have a plan, but you can apply that plan incorrectly. So assurance says I want to apply this plan the way it was designed, in order for it to be effective. And so you're going to follow processes. You're going to meet the standards. Uh, assure that this plan is is implemented correctly and this is part of the, this this is part of the exec uh, uh, executing uh, executing group uh, execution group uh, and so this is part of uh, executing uh, the processes and then finally quality control is monitoring the projects to improve now control here is identifying changes improving quality now sometimes these are combined and sometimes ident identifying changes will be quality assurance because if you implement the, the plan correctly, then that plan will identify changes. But my definition is quality control is where you take these changes and you actually improve the quality of your project. Now, improvement could be improve the actual project or it can improve the quality plan because the plan may be missing things. And so this is where you have audits. Uh, this is where you're going to have audits and quality assurance and quality control, making sure the plan is done correctly, making sure that the quality is actually improved. And this is part of the monitoring and controlling group. So you have the planning group, executing group, and then the monitoring and controlling group. Now, uh, let's bring back my website down here. Uh, and in quality control, quality down here for PMBOK2, for quality here, this video right here, uh, I encourage you to watch this video. Click the video. It's going to open this up. Let me, this will go, this is, this goes through uh, the history here. It's a presentation. It goes through how to solve right here, how to solve a real simple one. I have you do this. Okay, this is a real simple one. This is uh, uh, showing you exactly how to solve this, one of the homework problems. But it goes through all the different types of uh, applications. Uh, and down here further, let me see where it's at. Here is where I define the planning assurance control. And then I go through and describing American Society for Quality, how what they say about it. So I go in a lot more detail in these videos. So I encourage you uh, to work this, uh, uh, watch this video. And also this will show you how to do some of the homework. 
Okay, then project quality. So in project quality, uh, here we consider uh, the stakeholders from the different perspectives. In other words, when you define quality, you define it relative to the stakeholders, but you'll have different stakeholders, different perspectives. So you have to consider the stakeholders needs and expectations and what perspective do they have on this project and what are their interests in it? Uh, where, what are they gaining from it? Uh, recipients from the product or service like sponsor or customers, what do they define as quality or their expectations? Participants in the process, your team members, what their stakeholders, what are they going to derive from this? Uh, citizens of the project culture, like the management. Uh, this project is within this company. What's the company going to, what do they see as a quality project? What are they going to get from it, like assets, uh, the, the, the assets uh, or environmental assets or internal assets, uh, internal and external. Observers of the project environment. Regulatory agencies. Well, we want to make sure that we satisfy compliance. Okay, what are they going to see from the project that we have. If we meet all the cl compliance issues, then we're going to have an easier, easier uh, uh, path uh, down the road to implement more projects and also get to get sign off because we do th we do things right. So you have a, you have a product culture, the out the output, the deliverables, a process culture, a project culture, and a project environment. So you have all different kinds of uh, perspectives. And all of these perspectives are important when you define quality. So it's not as easy as, oh, let's just meet the requirements. No, there's a lot more than this. Look at your stakeholders. Contrast project quality from quality management. Well, for project, it's a fixed term. Business approach is long term. Cost, budget is tied to deliverables. Budget is tied to profitability. Scope, focus on the stakeholders. In a business, focus on organizational objectives. It progresses the organization. So these are key differences that a project manager has to understand to bridge the project quality and business quality. Both of these have to be satisfied, but the project has to be satisfied within the business quality. So it's challenging. So uh, and the criteria for defining quality, well, first of all, it's product driven driven conformist primary is you conform to the specifications and secondary it contributes to organizational and reputational image in other words the deliverables the deliverables primarily has to meet the specifications but secondary it has to contribute to the organizational reputation or the organizational image reputation externally image externally and internally to make sure that the project uh, fits uh, the image of the organization. Process driven. You meet your deliverables, again, but you enhance organizational assets. So process internally is that it met the deliverables as far as uh, the scope, time, and cost internally, but also you gain organizational assets internally. You've learned more this process has given more to the organization for future projects. And finally, quality driven, satisfying stakeholder needs and expectations and improving the morale of team members. Okay, so not only do you satisfy your stakeholders, but the morale uh, and also the, the uh, morale, also the support of your team members are important. Key, uh, keys to project quality management include your team members from the very beginning. Uh, it, that's part of communication plan as well. Uh, measurement and communication. Always, always measure so you have something to communicate. Communicate from the beginning to the end and always measure so you say here's the measurement is for accountability. Here's where we've been, here's where we are, where we're going and communicate that. And also that communicates uh, problems with uh, the quality as well. And focus on the timely deliverables that satisfy stakeholders. That's key because the timeliness of deliver deliverables is just as important as the deliverables and it satisfies the stakeholders in such a way that the stakeholders uh, will sign off, validate, validate, verify and validate as they go through. Okay. Now the rest of this is details. I don't get in too much into this details. 
This is for people who are going into certification, if you're gonna take a test after this, or you're gonna actually actually using some of this stuff as a project manager. The plan the quality. Uh, so this up here is, is pretty much general. That's kind of what I talk about down here. This is more specific. Okay, uh, the project deliverable standards requirements goes into the design and quality management plan. For example, you have your scope statement, work, vector, work uh, WBS, and the different project baselines, cost baseline, time baseline. Uh, you can have a communication plans, etc. The standards, you have internal and external standards here. Whoops. Internal and external standards within your company and also regulations, let's say. And then you have your stakeholders. What do they need and what are their expectations? And so from this quality management plan, it incorporates a lot of here's what we're going to be doing, here's how we're measuring it, here's our communication. So this has to connect with all the other plans you have. Here's my schedule, here's my cost, here's my communication, here's risk, uh, et cetera. Here's my stakeholder management, et cetera. Okay, so the input, uh, you have your enterprise environmental factors and you have organization internal assets. You have your project scope and you have your project management plan. Uh, that's the bigger plan. Now in your quality plan, it's gonna be part of your project plan. So you have your management plan, you have your communication plan, risk plan, and quality plan. It addresses QA and QC, assurance and control. A lot of people call this the same thing. QA, QC, QA slash QC. Sometimes they'll call both of these assurance, both of these control, or just quality. They call it all different things. Sometimes quality improvement. Uh, but it also addresses continuous improvement. So you're not, you don't improve and stop. You improve and use that uh, as a uh, improvement to improvement to improvement. Well, the quality plan could be what you're going to measure, when to, when to measure it, how to measure it, uh, who measures it, uh, why measures it, why do they measure it to know why they're doing it, uh, quality audits, reviews. So the quality plan could have a lot of different things in it. What to measure? Well, the need to measure quality characteristics can come from many different sources. Uh, and this is what I suggest. In deciding what should we measure? Well, if we do measure it, is it going to help? What's the value added? If you can't answer that in a positive way, don't measure it. What's it going to hurt you? If we don't measure it, is if we don't measure it, will it hurt us? What are the risks of not measuring it? You have to balance those two, okay, uh, to say, do we measure it? Third, do we have to measure it? Yes, fine, just do it. Don't think about it. Stop thinking and do. <laughs> and if you do it, do it as straightforward, as simple, as efficiently as possible. If you have to do it, do it. Fine, go for it. Now, uh, so, well, this could, these three things here, we could take an hour just to discuss this. And I'm sure each one of you could have something to say on each one of these. <laughs> uh, but a project manager and a project team say have to understand the project manager decided this, fine, let's go with it. Okay, then manage quality. Uh, you can have an audit, audit the results. The audit could audit either the results or audit the process uh, the actual plan itself to ensure improvement, best practices, plan updates. And then uh, controlling your quality. And here's where you have measurement analysis. The measurement is for accountability uh, and an analysis. Uh, but if you need to change, if you say yes, then verify quality improvement, change management, configuration management, plan updated. And so if you're changing your quality plan, then you go into integrated change management with all every, everything else. And make sure that the, verify your quality improvement that it has improved. You don't just change things to change and you change things to improve. Uh, and uh, the change management has done correctly, but also you configured it for the rest of the project. We've talked about that back in integrated change control. Now, the uh, different measurement and topics. I don't get into these this much, but I want to mention them because there's a whole discipline of quality management. And I'm, again, I'm not getting into this, but I want to mention it. 
Uh, w. Edwards Deming had the 14 points in the PDCA cycle, plan, do, check, act cycle. These 14 points are still used today. The 14 points are a basis for maturity models. The PDCA, PDCA cycle is, is basic for any type of design. Walter A. Schuhart uh, was, has been known, and that's in my video, uh, he was the one who uh, devised, he's the one who introduced, uh, developed, and popularized process control charts. It's used in almost every industry, especially uh, in, uh, in operations. And the process control charts are called, are called Shuhardian charts. And then you have uh, the uh, Kaoru Ichikawa. Uh, Kaoru Ichikawa uh, has the seven basic tools, which is extremely popular with consultants, cause and effect diagrams, fish tone charts. So these uh, are, are very commonly used in project management. And finally, Joseph Durand. Uh, there are so many others that are not here, but Durand, the vital many versus the trivial few, he popularized uh, the 80-20 rule or the Pareto analysis. Again, focus on what's important. Don't spend all your time on the unimportant, focus on the important. So just some simple, practical approaches to quality. Now from uh, this history, we have the seven management tools. We have Six Sigma. You can, you can be certified in Six Sigma. Some of you probably are. You can have a balanced scorecard. The balanced scorecard is management strategy for the C-level, for top-down uh, to actual reporting bottom up and management top down and the balance scorecard as a basis was uh, Deming's 14 points when you start looking at it. Uh, then total quality total quality management, distributed quality to where you don't just have quality top down, you distribute it to its distributed quality to the individual units where everybody has a mentality of uh, a, a culture of improving quality from the top and also to the bottom. So it's a dis TQM, total quality management, I call that distributed quality. Uh, then you have leadership, top to bottom, workplace factors. These are the metrics. And then finally, the cost of quality. Now these maturity models, this is within project management. And uh, sometimes people do this in their project at the end of the course. You have software, uh, functional deployment, capability models, and, and then the uh, organizational project management maturity models, top down. So these maturity models allow you to uh, monitor uh, the quality within a project. Now these maturity models usually focus on quality, okay, but there's another maturity model called the SCORE model, which focuses on supply chain. Well, embedded in that is project management. So project management is very, is, is everywhere, okay? It's hard to conduct business without addressing project management. Okay. And then down here, I listed the PDCA cycle. I listed the seven basic tools. I listed six sigma terminology. And I just did this as far as a as, uh, motivation for people to look deeper into it. We don't get that much into it in this course. Okay, risk analysis. Now in risk analysis, Let's bring up the risk lecture. Here we go. It's concerned with identifying, analyzing, responding to project risk. Well, there's risk analysis is, uh, there's a lot of different major processes. I'll be looking at uh, these five and then monitoring the risks. Okay, in this, most of this uh, knowledge area is concepts, uh, mostly concepts and how to approach risks. Okay, and this is more of a top-down planning type of thing. But I start with some definition of risk and utility. Uh, risk is uh, the, uh, the probability of an event happening and then the outcome of that event happening. Utility is an attitude toward that risk. Do you accept it? How do you, how do you address it? And then you have your risk management plan, identifying your risk with your risk register. The risk analysis could be quantitative or qualitative. And then here's where you plan for your risks. And here we'll be talking about positive and negative consequences and, a di and different types of plans to respond to risks. And then finally, monitoring your risk. We'll talk a little bit about uh, 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 risk analysis and, and uh, crisis analysis. Okay. Okay, risk and utility. And risk and utility here, 
the um, uh, you'll have two measures to define risk probability and outcome another word for probability would be likelihood of something happening another outcome is a consequence of something happening so there's two things that define risk the probability of something happening and the outcome of something happening okay well if you have a very high probability and a high consequence that's a high risk right here if you have a low probability and a low consequence that's a low risk but if you have a mixture of a high probability of something happening with a low consequence that's a moderate risk a low probability with a high consequence that's a moderate risk okay and this is where it's within a relatively uh, range within a range that, that's relatively uh, reasonable in other words if the consequence is extremely high then as long as there's any probability it's high risk for, for example if the consequence is death I don't care how low the risk is I'm going to take precautions okay now if the probability is extremely high even though it's a low consequence then it no longer becomes a risk if it's a really a 99.99% a probability this is going to happen well the consequence whatever no, no matter how low it's going to be something I'm going to have to deal with so I'm going to address it and so within a reasonable uh, co probability range here or a consequent range uh, that's where these where risk analysis uh, is appropriate now the attitude toward risk uh, risk neutral uh, is another is called utility is how how am I going to address the risk and so you'll have three different usually three different ways of addressing it risk neutral risk averse and risk prone uh, risk prone means you see risk as a value uh, the risk carries with it a high consequence and I'm looking more at the consequence not so much the probability in other words is the positive result I'm going to go for it and we'll define that in a minute risk averse is you avoid risk risk prone is you uh, address the risk and you go after the risk uh, risk prone would be like someone who is um, like a gambler or someone who is very aggressive okay risk averse is someone who's very conservative and this can be applied to stakeholders project team and organization and what I mean by this is some stakeholders are very 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 risk prone aggressive some are very risk averse conservative and so also the team members would be that way different, pro different organizations can be that way so in order to look at risk it's not just about oh here's the actual numbers it's okay how are the stakeholders going to look at this risk how will my team look at this risk how will the organization address this risk and how will the the society look at this risk and so the project manager has to not look just at the risk but also the attitude toward the risk or the utility of the risk uh, of all the different players okay you can also have measured risk and perceived risk okay you can have risks versus the barriers so sometimes risks are things that might happen barriers are things that will happen and risk management of the risks and measured risk and crisis management of things that could happen that I'm ready for it if it does happen but I'm not sure it's going to happen or not okay so you have three different things going on here uh, measured risk versus perceived risks that might happen barriers that will happen and risk management of things you you know might happen crisis management as you, you're prepared for things that you didn't know were going to happen okay so here's the idea of risk we have something called a reference lottery and in this reference lottery at this point right here you have a decision whether you go or no go so this is a risky decision of going because there's a risk of risk of winning and losing the certain dis certainty decision is no go I'm not going to take that risk because I'm going to I'm going to have a result of zero so if you have a risky decision here if you choose a risky decision of going what this is saying is well I have a probability of winning a dollar or losing a dollar so there's where the risk is but then if you have a 50 50 chance of winning and losing the expected profit then 50 percent winning and 50 percent losing 
0.5 times 1 plus 0.5 times minus 1, the expected profit then would be 0. Okay, But down here, if you choose not to go, then the value of that's going to be 0. So the actual value, the expected value of this chance node, this is a node, chance node of a risky decision at the decision node, the value of that is 0. But the value at the decision node of a certainty decision, the outcome is 0. So they have equal value as far as uh, uh, expected profit is concerned. Well, if you are risk neutral, then when you see, if you're risk neutral and you say zero, you, you see zero, zero here, okay? Actually, let me take this zero here and put it here because <laughs> that's kind of where it's at. Okay, uh, when you see zero, zero here, then a risk neutral day, I'm indifferent. It doesn't matter. I don't care. It doesn't matter which one. I'm one decision is not preferred over another. They have the same value. If you're risk prone, you're aggressive, then this risk here has value in your decision back here. And the value of this chance node is greater than zero because they they have more value they see more value in the probability, the likelihood of winning something than losing because they're risk prone. If you're risk averse, they will see this more value on the negative side and the risky decision will have a lower value. They'll have a negative value. This is no, 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 no. I'm not going to do it. So a risk prone decision maker in this case would choose go. A risk averse decision maker in this case would choose no go because risk has positive value just the risk part has positive value for a risk prone decision maker it has a negative value for a risk averse decision maker so as i said there's some logic here so there's some mental gymnastics which is important because this is exactly what the project manager has to think about and all the different stakeholders in his project how are they going to perceive the risk I can measure? This perception of risk, they can perceive it, but then how are they going to respond to it? That's the utility of the risk. <clears throat> key project risk management keys to it. First of all, planning. Uh, you need to balance. Uh, look at the project importance. So you can balance uh, the perceived risk, uh, the measured risk, utility toward risk. You have to balance all those out with all the different stakeholders and your team team members, but you have to focus on project importance. So this might be important, but does it does it really apply to the project? Responding in risk analysis. Well, you have a cost benefit type of type of analysis. That's true, but it has to be results driven. OK, what are going to be the results uh, on on this project? So focus on project importance and the results of the project. And also respond to stakeholders' perceptions. Closure. Well, communicate from the beginning to the end. Communications, communications, communications. And lessons learned. Whatever happened, uh, you'll have a risk register of risk that might happen, but then you'll start monitoring that risk. There are different uh, tools to monitor risks uh, that happened, that didn't happen. When they happened, what were the results? What was the response? What was the re this kind of thing. So lessons learned should be documented. Okay, uh, where do risks come from? Uh, so this is planning your risk. Okay, and uh, this is your risk breakdown structure, RBS. You break down where these risks could come from. It could come from the project. Risk according to their scope could change, time could change, cost could change, quality could change, stakeholders. Phases in phase one, you'll have different risks from phase two from phase three. Remember, phases is time. Business, you could have market risks with your project. You can have financial risk with your project, technological risks, and people risks. Uh, applications, uh, well, you can have risks according to event management, construction management, information technology, and supply chain management. 
So depending on what, what applications or industry you're in, they have particular risks that could be specific to that industry. Well, identifying your risk. Here's where your risk register comes. This is interesting. You identify the actual category, your work breakdown structure, and actually list name the risks. What is it? ID it. Say, ID risk number three is this, 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 and this. This could happen. And over here, you describe it. Okay, the event, series of events, consequences, impact. You describe what that risk means. Okay, over here, what's the source of the risk? Internal, external, business, project, etc. What's the level of the risk? High, medium, and low. And then comments. And the comments could be identifying triggers, trends, and patterns. We'll talk about that in a minute. Possible responses. We'll talk about uh, risk responses. Secondary and residual risk. We'll talk about that. Okay. So these comments in the risk register, this moves us away from just identifying the risk to actually analyzing the risks and coming up with a risk analysis. And that will be in your risk register, or should be. The risk analysis could be quantitative and qualitative. Okay, Qualitative, you can rank the risks. I think this is higher risk, this is lower risk. Uh, you can have a matrix of risk. Uh, you can have a risk factor and a watch list. Say, okay, I'm going to move these in the watch list. So we monitor these things. Low risk could be, uh, be off the watch list. Now, here you have performed quantitative analysis. And I want to point out that in the quantitative analysis, you'll have stochastic utility analysis or preference analysis. We won't get into that. You'll have decision analysis. We'll get into that a little bit in procurement. But also, risk quantitative risk analysis will involve the CPM and PERT analysis. Because in the CPM, you have time. In the PERT, you have probability. And probability is used as a, as a metric for risk. Higher probability, low probability is used in risk analysis. So uh, PERT CPM analysis is part of your risk analysis. So it will be there. And sometimes you'll have simulation. Simulation, when done correctly, can have a very good risk analysis. Okay, then you have failure modem analysis. That's up here in your qualitative. You can assign uh, uh, severity of a risk, the likelihood of the risk, and the de detectability. In other words, sometimes you'll have a risk, you don't even know it's there, and you'll have uh, a metric over here. And this priority number, then you can rank order it. The higher, the more, the more risky. It's called fail failure mode effect analysis. And this can be very effective when you have people, expert opinion, who know uh, it's all dependent on, the, on these measures in here. If you have people who can, could have very good measures, fine, it's going to work. And here's where you have your matrix in here. You can say, okay, I have, uh, you're not really assigning probabilities, you're assigning likelihood of very high, high, moderate, low, very low, and that will go into a probability. Okay, and then the impact. Again, very low, low, moderate, high, very high. That's assigned to a probability number. Now, is this numeric? Is this quantitative or qualitative? Well, well, in statistics, you'll say, okay, well, it's really qualitative because my judgment is right here. I'm coding this numerically, but the actual judgment is qualitative. That's qualitative. This is qualitative and I'm coding it in a numeric fashion, okay, whoops. And so I can multiply these together and then I'll have a thread here, okay. Uh, this is the negative. The impact is, is a very low, 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 negative. Okay, and this is a positive impact and this refers to as opportunity. Okay, so a very high probability here is a high risk negative. A high here is a high risk positive. A risk can be positive. Okay, uh, I'm going to buy a lotto ticket because I have a risk of maybe winning. <laughs> okay, pretty low probability, but still there's a risk there. And uh, it's only zero if you don't buy a lottery ticket, right? Anyway, the point is this is a probability impact matrix. Uh, and then you have decision trees. In a decision analysis, I, I teach decision, I've taught decision analysis for, for years, decades. 
I'm not teaching it now, but I have in the past. A lot on decision trees. This is a simple one. It can be very complex. And those decision trees can go, go into tables. Those tables can go to analyses and go into continuous distributions. Uh, strong weak, strong weak, depending on build and upgrade. Uh, and so we'll look at decision trees. And those trees can go to decision table. So these are these represent a quantitative analysis. Okay. Uh, then responses. Now these responses are important because these I will have in the homework. Uh, risks with negative consequences. Well, I have four different types of responses. Avoidance. It totally eliminate the risk. Well, how do you totally eliminate the risk? Uh, you give it to someone else. <laughs> Say, oh, that risk happens in that. Okay, I'm going to let let this department over here have that. You're responsible for that. So if that happens, it's up to you. Boom. I'm done with it. Acceptance. Do nothing. Okay, it's a risk. It's a low risk. I'm not going to do anything. If it happens, I'll deal with it. Transference. Sharing consequences or the outcome. Well, the classic example of risk transference uh, as far as a, a, a response, a transference risk response, is insurance. I'm going to pay insurance to you. If this happens, then you're going to pay for it. But I've already paid for it. But I'll pay for it later. And so you pay for it up front. I'll pay. So we're sharing this risk. Okay. Another type of transference risk response is uh, that we you can have part of the the uh, the uh, revenue or profit. You can have a positive result from this project. But if something happens, you'll pay for it. But if nothing happens, you're st you're going to get the, the the positive results, whether this risk happens or not. If it does happen, you pay for it. But you're taking the risk that it doesn't happen, but you're still going to get the benefit. So that's another way of sharing it. The other is mitigation. Now, the mitigation is actually reducing the likelihood of the impact or the outcome, the probability and outcome. You're reducing the impact of that. Okay. Uh, reducing the likelihood impact that should be or the, reducing the probability or the consequence of uh, the likelihood impact or the outcome it's reducing it in other words uh, you're going to reduce you're going to mitigate it to where uh, I'm lowering the probability that's going to happen maybe put more resources onto it uh, I'm going to mitigate the the severity of the outcome oh okay well I'm going to add add this to, to our processes. So if it does happen, it's not going to be that bad. So mitigation is lowering uh, the, the severity, either the probability or the outcome of a, um, uh, of a risk. Okay. Now notice in all four of these, the only one that actually changes the risk is mitigation. The rest of them is not doing anything to the risk. They're just responding to the risk. Mitigation is actually addressing the risk. Okay, you can also have risk with <coughs> risk with positive consequences. <coughs> you can have risk with the positive consequences. For example, uh, exploitation, ensuring the realization of an opportunity. If you see something that's positive. Well, then you're saying, okay, I want to ensure that this is going to happen because this would be good for me. Uh, you're going to support <coughs> the different, <coughs> support the mechanisms that could make this happen. Enhancement is actually going in and modifying the actual event itself, uh, the risk itself. The probability, consequence, drivers, triggers, increased likelihood. And so you're actually changing it so that it could happen. And sharing is uh, sharing the consequence or outcome for a mutual benefit. That I'll let you have this, and so that so we'll both have this together. And so you're going to use the, the actual result of that is sharing it with, with another 
another uh, unit. So these are uh, responses to uh, positive and negative consequences, but also in these responses, you have something called additional risks. Now you have residual and secondary. Those are not the same. Those are two different things. A residual risk, risk remaining after, after response measures. So a lot of times when you do something and you respond to a risk, and that's good, that's positive, for example, um, uh, you might not actually respond to all. So ris risk has some something negative that's going to happen. You're going to respond to that, and you might satisfy 50%, 60%, but there's other risks that you really didn't cover all of it. You covered most of it, enough to go, but then there's other residual risk that still remains. You didn't solve it all. You solved part of it. <clears throat> Secondary risks are additional risks int introduced by res responses. In other words, if you respond to something, but not all of it, that's residual risk. But if you respond to this, that causes something, uh, respond, uh, a negative uh, risk someplace else, or that uh, additional risks over here, that's called secondary risks. And those are very common. And so, sometimes those are very insidious. You don't see those happening, but they're there. Okay, additional plans. Well, contingency plans is planned responses to risk occurrences. In other words, if this happens, we move to plan B. That's our contingency plan. Boom. This happens, boom. Move plan B, let's go for it. So that is plan. You're ready for it. It's contingency plan. Contingency, we talked about contingency budgets. Fallback plans, these are different. These are planned responses to failed primary responses. Okay, you say, oh, okay. It could be a, a response. It could be contingency plan. But, okay, I'm responding to this. It failed. Uh, okay, my contingency plan failed, for example. Or my response failed. Okay, I want to have a fallback plan. So here's my fallback plan. Say so I'm backing up, and, and so I'm moving away from the consequences and starting again. Okay, so the additional plans, contingency plan, has to do with uh, when risks happen, you respond to them. But a fallback plan is when you have failures. Okay. And so down here, contingency planning uh, is um, high risk potential events or predictable surprises. Uh, and so these, these uh, contingency planning has an ADPEU, anticipate, design, prepare, then you have the event happening, and execute an update. So there's a whole discipline around contingency planning because contingency planning within risk analysis is key. And so you're ready to go. So when it happens, you don't want that risk to totally destroy a project. You're going to have those contingency plans ready to go so that uh, you can respond to that quickly and keep moving forward. Identification uh, and also consider resources have a flexible principle. Flexible supply contracts, multi-sourcing, reserve shipping, uh, temporary workers. So all those are elements of a flexible principle within your contingency plans. Okay. Monitoring your risks. Well, here's where you're going to monitor. You're going to conduct risk audits to make sure that uh, the plan is done correctly or the plan needs to be changed. Uh, risk reviews, uh, just just to update, uh, to, to verify uh, that what's happening is happening correctly. Analyze triggers, trends, and patterns. This is important. Triggers are events that could trigger risks. Trends are not necessarily an event, but it might a sequence of events, uh, and sequence of events that might uh, to get individually wouldn't trigger a trend, trend uh, a, a risk, but together uh, is moving toward a risk happening. So it's a moving in that direction. Now, patterns are not necessarily events. It's more of a culture. It's, it's more of an, an attitude or, or maybe uh, the fabric of a culture moving to something that, that might lend itself to trends and lend itself to, to triggered acts, uh, actions or acts that would cause, uh, uh, increase the probability of a risk. So analyze the, an, analyzing these things is keeping on top 
of your risks within a project. Okay. So I want to talk about the difference between contingency planning and crisis management. Contingency planning is proactive and it has to do with planning. In other words, you say I, you identify your risk and that's what we're talking about, risk, risk register, uh, risk responses. Uh, it's proactive. Say, okay, I've identified these risks that could happen. They haven't happened yet, but they might. If they do, I'm being proactive and planning. Here's how I'm going to respond to them. That's contingency planning. Crisis management is reactive. And it says, well, there are risks out there I know that I that I haven't identified. I may not I may not know what those risks are, but I believe they exist. And it always happens. Things happen you don't expect. Unplanned. And you want to react to that by creating a process of if I have if this risk happened, I didn't plan for it, I don't have a response. What do we do? What do we do? Well, we move into a process of defining what's going to be done. Everyone knows what to knows what to do. So in this process, uh, this has to do with being uh, aware of what's happening, uh, being flexible, saying, okay, I know we don't have a plan, but let's not fall apart. Let's come together and respond accordingly. Empowerment. Empower the people to identify things that need to be done, when they need to be done, where they need to be done, and communicate up and down the line. Okay? All this awareness of what's happening, flexibility within your management, and uh, even a distributed flexibility, empowerment uh, up and down the line, communication really defines organizational preparedness for crisis management. Uh, and it can tell this could be a whole course unto itself, but it's important to have at least a little bit of that within your project. Because when something happens you don't expect, what are you going to do? You always, you've already identified, this is how we're going to approach this. So let's bring this together, being flexible. You're empowered to make these decisions, communicate, being aware of how what everyone is doing, come together and move forward. Okay. Well, the last thing we're covering today is procurement. Uh, now, procurement is a third party going outside either services or uh, uh, material. So let's bring up procurement. Okay, here it's concerned with the identification, acquisition of goods and services from outside sources. And I'm gonna, only going to look at two of these things here, uh, plan and conduct. Uh, the controlling, uh, I'm not going to really get into. Uh, so first, I'll, I'll talk about procurement as a topic. Uh, you have outsourcing. It's called different things. Outsourcing, subcontracting, purchasing, buying, third-party sourcing. I'll talk about the uh, procurement plan and some of the terminology, and then conducting procurements. Here's where I talk about how you actually make decisions in a selection process. Okay, first of all, procurement. Uh, again, it could be outsourcing, subcontracting, purchasing, buying, third-party sourcing. All of these are part of procurement, but each one has a little bit different connotation. Okay. Uh, you can either procurement of material or functions, services. And uh, before you do that, you conduct something called a needs assessment. Why are you going outside? Why don't, why don't you do it inside? Uh, what's the time, cost, resource, capability requirements before you decide to go outside? Uh, do you don't have enough time to do it inside? You don't have the, it's cost too costly, it's cheaper to go out, outsource. It's not that critical, I can do it. I don't have the resources to do it internally. I don't have the capability of doing it internally. Uh, uh, the requirements uh, are so onerous, uh, onerous that I need to go outside. Uh, what Then if you're going to do it, what are you going to outsource? Goods, and that's called refresh, request. RFQ is a request for quote. If it's goods, you send out an RFQ and you say, I want you to give me a quote but the RFQ outlines how that quote was to be delivered. You can give me a quote, but tell me what you're doing, uh, the quality, so you outline exactly how that quote was is to be given. Or you can have an RFP, request for a proposal of services. 
A proposal says, oh, you tell me what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, quality, this kind of thing. So uh, request for quote on material and goods is very different request for proposal of services uh, or functions that are going to be provided. Or you can have both. Okay. And so why are you going out? Give it, give a reason for, for actually outsourcing or procurement. And then what are you going to do? So these two are big questions. Okay. And we've already mentioned in uh, time management in scheduling, when you have an activity that has a lot of slack, maybe you want to outsource it. Maybe you want, you want to go outside. Okay. Your procurement plan. Again, uh, I, I want to say up front, uh, I've been on, I haven't been on the <clears throat> side where I will respond to these things. I've been on the side where I send them out and I receive them and I make selections. In other words, uh, you have your procurement plan. Uh, you can, uh, first of all, look, oh yeah, make buy. Uh, can I do it internally? If I do it internally, what's the cost? If I go outside, what's the cost? What are the risks? And so you have to analyze that up front. Uh, you can have contracts, long-term contracts, statement of work, request for proposal. Uh, the statement of work uh, could be embedded in your, <clears throat> we talked uh, on um, about um, the activity list. And the activity list would have a description of what that activity is. Well, in that activity list, you describe the activity. Well, that activity could be part of the statement of work uh, if you want to outsource it. And so the activity list must have enough detail that it could be part of a statement of work on SOW for a third party. And the request for proposal then would be for work to be done. The procurement management plan could include, include but not limited to, you know, the introduction, the definitions, the contracts, the different types of contracts, uh, the vendor management. Uh, the vendor man management is important. Uh, Identify governance structure, validation procedures, schedule for creating reporting, SOWs and ROP. When do you report it? How do you report it? What's the structure? Uh, what are the risks? Identifying the risks, the constraints, the contract approval process is key. Uh, how do they know that they're going to be approved and by what process, the timing, etc. Uh, documentation requirements, communication plans, and acceptance selection. All these are part of or your procure, pro, procurement plan. And this management plan could have different types of uh, uh, engagements on different third parties. Okay, going a little deeper, I'm not going to go into, here's, here's your make-buy analysis, doing a break-even analysis. I'm not going to go into this. Uh, types of contracts, uh, we could have um, uh, a firm fixed price, uh, or we could have cost reimbursement. A fixed price contracts where you say, here's the money, do the work. Cost reimbursement, you say, here's the money, I'll pay for all the costs as long as you do the work, and I'll pay for the, the work to be done. And there's all different types of uh, contracts for that. And uh, I'm not going to go into that in this course. I could go into that deeper. And in this, you talk about the risks as far as the risks to uh, to the buyer and to the seller. And here's an SOW and RFP. An SOW is statement of work. Uh, an RFP is request for proposal. Or you can always have a request for information. Often an RFI will go out before the RFQ goes out. Uh, well, and also the RFI and RFQ before the RFP. Uh, get a quote. Get information before you have a proposal. And the statement of work, though, uh, here's where you identify the project, the scope of the work, the period, the timing, uh, the location, the requirements, the schedule, the, mi the schedule. Here are the milestones. Well, the schedule milestones is what is delivered at what point uh, milestone within the project, acceptance criteria, and then finally acceptance. And then over here on the RFP and RFQ and RFI, these are different. Introduction, state the purpose of the RFP, the background organization, who submitted the RFP or the RFQ, RFI, the context of the RFP, uh, the scope, uh, the guidelines, uh, the proposal request, evaluation criteria, the vendor qualifications, 
In other words, you say, tell me exactly how I want you to tell me what you can do. And it has to be fairly detailed or else you're going to get, yes, I can do it. No, tell me what you're doing, how you're doing it, this kind of thing. Now, the last thing I'm going to cover is, is the selection process. Now, in the selection process, <clears throat> and I'll cover this more in the homework, here I have different proposals, uh, different proposals that are, have an RFP, different proposals coming in. Uh, suppose there are four criteria, technical approach, management approach, past performance, and price, and they're weighted, and then we have internal scores here. Well, the traditional way of doing it is multiplying the weight times the scores and getting a weighted score here, and the highest score wins. Okay, and a lot of times this is done, uh, but the way this is done is not very good. Uh, it's not accurate. The one with the highest score is very misleading. Okay, uh, mainly because of the magnitude of these numbers. The one with the highest price is going to win. Not necessarily. That means all these others have a much lower magnitude, and all these three approaches pretty much are ignored. Because this will dominate the decision. And so that's what I mean by this is a very poor way to do it. Uh, or you can, this is, this is extra scores. Or you can rank it. Okay, within the technical approach, I'm going to rank it one, two, three. Management, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And then do a weighted score. And notice these are the same. And this has the, okay, now one's going to win again. Instead of ranks, you can have points. Take the points here and allocate the points like 0 or 1 to 30. I can allocate points to each one of these, each one of these, each one of these, each one of these. Okay? Uh, and sometimes these points, sometimes these points that say, I have 30 points to allocate, where are you going to allocate them? And it has to sum to 30. Okay, that's another way of doing it. Okay, that's, that's a good way. It's not a bad way at all. Uh, and then you have, uh, you add up the points, okay? And when you add up the points, uh, then you have a winner, Delver, which is a third, okay? Actually, you have a weighted, a weighted score. You have a weighted score. If the 30 is allocated, 30 is allocated, 20 is allocated, 20 is allocated, where each of these sum to 30 and sum to 20, then you just add up, add up, uh, the points. Uh, I, don't, I don't even have that in here. I could have had that. Uh, that's a decent way to do it. The best way to do it is something called an unbiased scores, ranking, and points. It doesn't matter what you put in here. It could be qualitative or quantitative. It's called an unbiased weighted score. And essentially what you do, whatever numbers you put in here, okay, here you have price. So what I do is you say, okay, I want to make some decisions. First of all, these numbers in here are a ratio scale. Uh, let me, uh, there's a number of things you put in here. Let me put it right here. Actually, I should have said this. Let me put it here. Let me merge these. Okay, first thing you do, make sure all these numbers that you put in here, let me, let me take this out for now. Uh, I'll leave it in. Okay, first thing you want to do is if I can get it over here. There we go. Okay, first thing I want to do is ratio scale. And what that means is, is all of these numbers you put in here are ratio scale. Uh, in other words, uh, zero means zero. There's no measure. And as you go up, uh, if I put 40 and 20, 40 is twice as good as 20. And 30 is twice as good as 15. So it's ratio scale. The second is no negative numbers, no zeros, no zeros and no negative numbers, no negative values, okay? Uh, no zeros, no negative numbers, okay? Uh, and then uh, higher is better, okay? It could be higher is better, lower is better, but notice in price, 
the lower the price is better, but in the technical management past performance, higher is better. So there's a mixture of, of, uh, uh, of the uh, ranges, okay? Higher is better, but if it's a ratio scale, higher is better, you take the reciprocal of the number. So the reciprocal then, higher would be better. So I've taken a lower is better uh, value, the reciprocal then for a ratio scale, higher is better, and you have call, what's called transitive properties. So then what you do, you sum the scores, just the scores, not the weight. You sum, sum these scores, and then you take the weights, you divide by the sum, and get a what is called normalized weights. You normalize weights by the sum of the scores. And then you take these normalized weights and multiply to get a unbiased, let me say normalized, weighted score. And so these right here have a property where what you put in the weights, what you put in these, these, these values in here, in the scores and the values, then, then the relationships you, you put in there with a ratio scale, higher is better, etc., is retained. And so this is going to be an unbiased score. These others up here can be biased by how you put the numbers. But once you have the weights and once you have the numbers, this technique is called an unbiased normalized weighted score. And it has mathematical properties to where you can defend that no matter where you go with government, with uh, industry, with uh, legal, you can defend that. And it has good mathematical properties. And I cover this, uh, I think I, I cover this in the, uh, in the homework. So there's a lot of material here, but a lot of good material. This is an introduction. Uh, so boom, this introduction, uh, you come back to this for the next, uh, to the rest of this course actually, until we get into agile projects. So the next couple of weeks, I'll be building on this and have a, have a, a, a homework that's going to build and build and build on all of these. Okay, uh, The primary one I'm going to build on is going to be the schedules. Well, that's all I have for this, for this uh, lecture. Uh, again, a lot of material. That's why it's recorded. Uh, you can go back and look at all this stuff. The next thing I'm going to do is post the homework. And then I'm going to have a video on the homework on how to approach the homework. And so with this video on introducing the definitions and relationships and concepts, the homework video where I'm looking at uh, applying it and then working the homework together, we're going to learn this. This homework assignment, the next homework assignment, and the next homework assignment. Okay, so now we're going to start building the analytics part of project management. It's going to be an exciting ride. It's going to be fun. A lot of good material. So here's the introduction. Uh, I hope this helps. Uh, it's designed to get us started with a quantitative area of project management. So between now and the next time I see you, take care.